So we're going to kick off next with, um, with Steve August from Revelation and um, Andrew Sower from P&G. I'm terrible with names. Whoever gave me this job, it was a bad decision. Um, so um, Andrew and uh, Steve are going to be talking about small leaps and big purchase moments using digital qual to understand key moments in product transactions. Okay. Um, so please welcome Andrew and Steve to the stage. All right. Uh, it's good to be here. Hello, Northern Kentucky. All right. Wow, it's got a lively audience today. We wouldn't have gotten that in Ohio. Uh-uh. Well, it's great to be here today. Um, so uh, there's been a lot of presentations about the technology, about all these amazing things that we can do with, with mobile and online and digital technology. And um, what we're going to do uh, is, is sort of back up a little bit and approach this from not necessarily first the technology, but really what insight problem are we solving? Or an example of an insight problem, an insight gap that we need to fill to answer a specific business question. And the, the problem that we're addressing and that uh, we're going to speak about is this idea of product transitions. The idea that people have to move from one product to another, something they're using, something they're, they're consuming, and at some point, they have to make a change. Um, they're going to have to make an, They're going to have to revisit that decision eventually. Um, and there's a number of reasons why this happens for all of us. Uh, it could be a matter of capabilities. It could be a matter that the product has been consumed and used up, or it could be that we, as the consumer, have changed or grown or evolved in some way. So, some of these are are, are fairly straightforward. So. Um, a big reason for a product transition is capability slash obsolescence. Uh, we see our little uh, Salvador Dali-esque surreal art of the, um, the obsolete products. You've got records, turntables, telephones with actual cords and uh, dials, uh, certain kinds of TV, and even 8-bit games. Um, you know, those things are, people had to upgrade from those things. Um, they had to go from VHS to DVD to streaming. And at each point in that, that sequence, they had to make a decision. They had to revisit a decision about what they were going to do. Uh, consumption. Sometimes it's, they have to upgrade or make a product decision because they've consumed it and they need to, to get the next new thing. So an example of that would be a car lease. They've leased it for three years and They've used up their usage of the car. They have a decision. They're going to make a product transition. Um, and sometimes consumption cycles are long, like a three-year cycle. Sometimes they're extremely short. But there's always an opportunity there, potentially, to revisit that decision. And then finally, uh, another reason, obviously, is that we change as people. Our needs change. We grow up. We're kids. We're, we're, we're teenagers. We're adults. We're adults with a, a job, a career, a family. Um, and our needs change, and, the, and our, the way we look at the world changes. And as we move through that, uh, that sequence of life, um, we make a ton of product transitions. And the thing about some of these uh, product transitions is that we can identify, for some of them, when it's going to happen. So, uh, and that's the case study, part of the case study we're going to talk today. But we know if you know, somebody leased a car three years from now, they're going to have another product decision they're going to make. If, they, if, if we know that they change their oil every 3,000 miles, they have an, another product uh, transition or service transition they could possibly make. So those, every one of those product transitions is an opportunity, right? It's an opportunity for somebody to revisit a decision. And it, the more we know about that decision, the more we know about that process, it can help us uh, learn how to maximize um, the benefit of that, whether it's can we keep people in our own products or can we uh, get people to shift from other products and services to the ones that, that we're offering. The thing about these product transitions is often they don't happen, they unfold. It's not like somebody wakes up one morning and they go, oh, time for a product transition. I think I'll do this. It happens over time. We, you know, each one of those things don't obsolete overnight in the sense that it takes time for people to absorb new uh, new technology, new changes, and then come to a decision. Uh, you know, it takes time uh, to make that decision. It takes time when people are growing and evolving. 
And sometimes they don't even realize they're in the product transition, um, in a sense. They just, they're starting to evaluate their, their options. Um, and so that makes it kind of uh, tricky to capture in a single point, moment of time piece of research. So um, these, the, the things that people are considering over the time, and they're happening at home, they're happening in the stores, they're happening as they're seeing ads, they're happening everywhere, and it's all an evolving story. And if we really want to understand what's going on in that story, we want to understand their whole experience. And if we think about it, the experience, the different layers of experience, you know, they have the behaviors, what they're buying, what they're doing. We have the context of that, of what, what's going on in their life, what's going on in their environment, what other factors are at play, um, and then the, the emotions that drive that. And if we can get, understand these three layers um, through that story, we can make some really, really uh, great findings and start really understanding how we can best position ourselves and our companies to uh, take best advantage of these transitions. So the trouble with doing this in traditional qualitative is that it's a, it tends to be a very single point in time. So traditionally, qualitative researchers have a very small sliver of access to people's lives, 1% uh, of, you know, roughly. Uh, of you know, an hour or two in a focus group, an hour or two in an in-home on or on the phone, and yet most of life happens while we're not there. And most of the interesting things, especially in these kind of stories, happen while we're not there. So how do we get there? Well, now we have this uh, wonderful digital technology that we've been immersed in um, this whole weekend. This is what my company, Revelation, does, offers a digital qualitative platform, both online and mobile, to get at these. Uh, consumer experience, to understand those behaviors, those layers of uh, context and emotion. So that gives us uh, a couple of powerful things. The access to people over time to, 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 to see these stories unfold, and the ability to get into those different layers of experience. That's the win. So uh, what it does is it flips that pie chart. Suddenly, we can be with people as their stories are unfolding and inject ourselves in those places and start to see what's really going on? What are the real reasons that we're winning or losing these product transition battles? And so with this, I'm going to hand it over to Andrew here, who's going to go through a very specific case study on how this unfolded for us. Thanks, Steve. Um, so I have, just to start out, some good news and bad news for everybody. The, um, the bad news first is, unfortunately, I'm going to be talking about diapers. Uh, and that's just not the world's sexiest product category, I know. Um, the good thing is, though, I realized this was going to be kind of right before lunch, and so I took out all the pictures of dirty diapers, so I won't be turning anybody off their lunch, at least. Um, we had a realization um, at, at P&G that we were losing volume and market share um, as moms switched between diaper sizes. And, you know, one might not think that changing diaper sizes is a real big purchase decision, um, but, you know, when we're starting to lose volume and market share for a particular product, that, that becomes a little concerning. Um, and there's a lot of reasons that can cause this. We could have um, uh, price sensitivity. Uh, my, my baby's gotten older. They're no longer this fragile little thing. They're a toddler now. I, uh, I don't need the nicest product anymore. Or it could be brand confusion. I didn't know what product came next. Um, so I bought the next size, and it happened to be a different product. Um, or it could be a performance issue, and that's actually where I kind of come in. I, I work on the product design. And um, that's what I was really concerned might be happening, is that, that at that point when moms were switching sizes, that specific point in time, we actually had a difference in the product or the way the product performed for those particular people. So the objective was to understand really the entire process that moms are going through when they switch between diaper sizes. And we wanted to do this at mom's own natural pace, and we did not want to influence her, her decision process. So if you bring in moms into a, a focus group or you recruit moms and you say, I'm looking for moms who have just started trying a new diaper size, or I'm looking for moms who, have, uh, who are thinking about the next, biggest, uh, the next bigger uh, product size, uh, and you start talking to them about product size and how they're going through that decision process, well, they're already in the process. And so they're reflecting back on how they started it, which might have been some time ago. And you're not really capturing, well, actually, you know, a month ago, I, I bought the next figure size, and I tried it, and it didn't work out for whatever reason. You end up capturing something very different, and you've also kind of influenced her. So um, the Revelation platform ended up being a great platform for, for doing this uh, study. We, we designed a three-month-long um, kind of immersive virtual ethnography type of study. Um, 
where we, we just watched moms for three months. We talked to them about their diapers that they were using. We talked to them about um, their world as it relates to their baby. Um, and, but we didn't tell them what we were interested in at all. We just kind of watched them for three months. And we waited until uh, we had weekly assignments. Um, and, and we did some interactive stuff. We actually we created kind of an online community. I had never heard of um, MROC studies before I came here. Uh, but that's basically what we did. Uh, we try to create a community to keep people very involved in it. Um, and um, we sent them out to the store and stuff. And then when they happened to mention that they had switched diaper sizes, we said, oh, that's really interesting. You switched diaper sizes. Uh, why'd you buy the new size diaper? And, um, and how did that process go? And what did you see at the store when you bought it? Because it was right then. They had just done it. So what we learned is that there's um, a lot changes in three months, diapers included. So babies go through this huge transition. Uh, uh, this, these are photos of actual panelists from the study that we collected. Um, this is what this is the transition that this particular uh, girl went through over th over three months. Pretty big change. Um, you can see the diapers also changed quite a bit over three months. And um, the small size diaper you've got on the um, on your left, and then the larger size diaper on the right at the same point in time. And well, the one on the left looks kind of small, and the one on the right looks pretty big. Um, and so we got a lot of comments around. I didn't understand why there's such a huge gap in sizes. Um, they're huge on him. What the heck? And I wish I could actually buy diapers in half sizes. And when we typically place research with, with uh, consumers who are using a current size diaper, say we, I don't know, have size 4 diapers. We recruit people who are using size 4. Well, they're in size 4 because size 4 fits them right then. So you don't learn about these people who wish they were in size three and a half or, or whatever. You don't learn about these people who are looking for a half size. You learn about people who the size currently works for them. Uh, we also in store had some interesting revelations. We, had, we realized that people, uh, no pun intended for the revelation. Um, we, it's what you get. Yeah. <laughs> it's just what you get. We, we realized that people were, were switching brands even because different brands fit differently at that, at that point in time when, when they were looking for a new product. So they would switch to Huggies because Huggies run bigger, and then they would switch back to Pampers at the size transition. And that's not really what we want to hear as makers of Pampers. You know, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty big insight there. And uh, we also hear things like, uh, I was looking for my product in the next bigger size, but I couldn't find it at the store. Do they, do they make this product in the next bigger size? And the fact wasn't this particular size. No, we don't. You have to switch product labels, at least. And so people didn't even realize this. And so there was some, definitely some, some brand confusion. Um, so some advantages that we had from this particular platform, we were able to capture natural experiences, um, the way they unfolded in mom's, in mom's actual life and in baby's life, we were able to, to compare this uh, nice life frame data that we got um, to technical data, very, very targeted and focused data at the end of the study. So we were able to link both this, this uh, life frame stuff to actual like, measurements. We had, we had moms measure their babies. How big are you at the time that they actually went through that transition? Um, and of course, it was a fraction of the cost of what it would have costed to, to try and do something like this in home, which would have been the traditional approach to doing a study like this. Um, and so the, the big result here was we realized the products don't fit right at the size transition. Um, and so that opens up a whole lot of opportunity for how we design our sizes and our size transitions. So I'll turn it back over to Steve here yeah, to wrap up. Andrew. So uh, remind me again, how big is the diaper category? Like, how big a business is that? The Pampers brand just hit $10 billion uh, a couple weeks ago. So it's a Pretty big business, I'd say. Right. So when we say small leaps, big product opportunities, this is a perfect example of that. Um, and as you saw, again, this didn't happen. The, the transition didn't just happen in, in one single point of time. It unfolded. It unfolded at people's homes. It unfolded when they were out. They unfolded in the store. And being able to capture that whole story and then see what was really going on, capture that opportunity. I mean, that's what this is really all about, right? All the technology, all the things we're talking about. And so that we can get clarity into those types of insight gaps and make good decisions on it. With that, we'll wrap up and take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. So do we have any questions from the audience at all? Oh, we've got one, we got uh, one in the back. Yeah. From David yeah. Forbes. Hi, it's David Forbes from Forbes Consulting. Uh, I'd love to get more of a feel of how this interchange actually took place. Did you, you know, engage in outbound calls to the folks on their mobile devices to get them? To, I mean, surely they weren't online with you 24 hours 
a day, though I know that graph would suggest that you might aspire to that. Oh, no, it's not so much that we aspire that they're on 24 hours a day, per se. It's that we have access to things when they happen. To, to, so if they're, you know, sort of like the, uh, the folks at DSCALP said this morning, if you've got the, them framed up to recognize key moments that you can't be there for as a researcher, they can capture it for you. That's what the pie chart was about, not actually being... Sure, no, I, I, I was being facetious. But okay. So you gave them lists of events that if this starts to happen, please do this and that, or, or was, did you outbound bit, call them, or what? It was, it was a bit the other way around. We, uh, we had regular activities that they would participate in, and then we had um, fun activities. So we had the fun activities really just to build a sense of community, to get a better understanding of life frame, and then we had every week tell us um, uh, on the day that you go shopping, log into the to the site and tell us what, what you bought in the terms of baby care products. And so we had a little trigger. One of them was, if you bought diapers, what size diapers did you buy? And when they bought the next size diaper, that triggered an additional activity that, that they responded to. Great. So it was, it was kind of event triggers, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Do you have any more questions at all? Yeah, I have a question here. Um, you say that it's about observing three-month natural behavior, and I also saw product placement, how did Product placement fit in that natural behavior, and where did you fit it in? We put it at the end on purpose. Um, so again, we were interested in when these moms had transitioned to the next size diaper. So conveniently for us, um, the thing we're interested in is, OK, we know they went through the transition process. They picked a product that they like. What about all those other products that they didn't try? Do those work for them or not? So we placed them with a bunch of products that they, did not, that they chose, opted not to try. Hi. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I actually thought the, the example you gave was one of the best I've seen of, of explaining why a longitudinal community that runs for that length of time and the idea of an idea emerging over time it was a really great example. I was wondering, were you going looking for that challenge of specifically around switching between sizes? Was that why you did what you did? Was that one thing that emerged from let's just engage with mums over, over an extended period of time? It was the actual objective of the study, yeah. We had, we had some data that, that indicated that during that period, something interesting happened and we didn't know what it was. Um, so yeah, that was, that was actually the objective we went in with. And we figured the best way to do that would be to watch people as, as the whole process unfolds. So we, we kind of targeted people who might be, you know, might be getting close to that process. I was just going to say you have to be quite enlightened to invest three months <laughs> to six months of time in that kind of research study to answer that one, that one question. I mean, you know, it's a, it's yeah. a, a positive, you know, and a lot of brands won't, because it's, it's quite expensive to keep a group of mums working for three months or that length of time to get into that issue. Yeah, it's quite it a was, bit more expensive to, to not win the, the product transition battle, too. So. That's right. Absolutely. absolutely. The size yeah. of the pride is pretty absolutely. big. Absolutely. But it just shows that that investment in that case is worth it. Yeah. The, the other little, little uh, plug I'll make here, just kind of a funny story related to that, is that um, things happen. It, to the research team over the course of three months, too. And so, yeah, it is, it's a big investment to make, and it's also a bit unpredictable. So one of the great things about having a mobile tool, um, or a, a tool, at least a tool that's mobile-enabled, I actually got married in the middle of the study, went on my honeymoon for two weeks, and I sat on the, sat on the beach, and I posted activities for the panelists, and I responded to their stuff on, from the beach on my honeymoon. And it worked great. It was, literally, it was, it was, it was seamless. Yeah. So. And he's still married. And I'm still married, yeah. <laughs> that worked out, too. Yeah. Total success. <laughs> <laughs> other questions? Any other questions? I'm not seeing any arms raised. Um, okay, maybe that's a good time to say thank you very much, Steve. Andrew. Thank you. Thank you.